Hey everybody, what's up? Aaron here, Question Period Canada. We're doing a Senate live broadcast. It should be very interesting. I believe that we've got Stephen Gabot is going to be in the hot seat today, so it should be very interesting. I've not seen one of these Senate um, question periods where they have an MP, a minister, in this case of the environment, Stephen Gabot, an MP from Quebec. Um, it should be very, very interesting. I th think that these senators are going to go hard. I can't imagine that Plett is just going to let any liberal walk by without having a lot of questions asked. So let's jump right into it. Honorable Senate, Senator, Senate question period. Honorable let's get senators. it going. It being nearly 2.20 Thanks for joining 20 us. p.m., the Senate will proceed to question period. The minister will take his seat and we will then proceed. I'm looking forward to this. I'll, I'll try to speak very, very little. I, I, when you're sitting here, you feel like you should be talking, but I know that talking over the senators and the MPs, that's not a... But now he's going to be in front of all the bosses because, like, the MPs answer to the Senate. And, well, very much looking forward to it. We'll get set up here. We'll see what the proceedings are going to look like. Honorable Senators, Honorable Senators, today we have with us for question period the Honorable Stephen Guilbeault, PCMP, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. On behalf of all Senators, I welcome the Minister. Senators, let me remind you that during question period with the Minister, the initial question is limited to 60 seconds and the initial answer to 90 seconds, followed by one supplementary question of at most 45 seconds and an answer of 45 seconds. The How reading much do you clerk think those glasses cost? 10 seconds before these times expire. Grand? Pursuant to the order adopted by the Senate, senators do not, have to, do not need to stand and question period will last 64 minutes. Okay, 64 minutes, Senator we're looking Plath. forward to it. Minister, it won't surprise you that my first question is about Bill C-234, which provides an exemption from the Prime Minister's carbon tax for Canada's farmers. I suspect that's also why you are here before us today, to influence senators and how they will vote on this bill. You say that the Trudeau government doesn't tell senators what to do or how to vote. And then in the next breath, you freely admit to having conversations with senators about the bill. A bill that passed the elected House with broad support. How many senators have you spoken to, Minister, about Bill C-234? How many have you pressured to vote against or gut this bill and de deny the desperately needed tax relief for our farmers? Minister Gilbo. Uh, zero. What? <laughs> What? And yet, and yet, you have admitted that you have spoken to them. Now you say zero. Zero. I've I asked you how many have you spoken to, Minister. You said zero. No, you said how many. No, I said how many have you spoken to. I sincerely doubt that you're calling these senators to talk about the weather. Come clean about what you're doing, Minister. You want a specific outcome on Bill C-234, and you're calling around to senators to make sure you get it. If that's not being whipped, Minister, what is? How can the Trudeau government think a minister calling up independent senators to talk about a private member's bill that passed the House isn't putting pressure on how they vote? How many did you call? Mr. is awesome. Plet is great. Uh, with all due respect, Senator, there's a world of difference between talking to someone and pressuring someone and whipping someone into doing something or voting in a certain way. You ask me how many did I pressure or, or whip, and the answer is zero. Said. Senator Marshall. Yes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, the Parliamentary Budget Officer released a report last week which estimates that government you subsidies to three ba battery manufacturers, North Volt, Volkswagen and Stellantis, could reach $43.6 billion. This is $5.8 billion more than what your government has announced. It's also important to note that these projects haven't really gotten started yet. The Parliamentary Budget Officer says that about 60% of this cost will be incurred by the federal government. Minister, has your government now revised its fiscal projections to include the Parliamentary Budget Officer's estimate? And if not, <coughs> why not? Monsieur le Ministre. Merci. 
So obviously the, the work of the Parliamentary Budget Officer is, is very important and our, our government is in the process of analyzing last week's report and obviously the, the, the appropriate minister, which is the Minister of Industry, Science and Economic Development, will respond in the near future. Thank you. Senator Marshall? Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, I, I find that your government is very secretive when it comes to providing taxpayers and parliamentarians with information about government spending. And I raised this matter with Senator Gold on several occasions. There have been many questions raised about the cost of these agreements and their benefits, including jobs. It is simply not possible to find this information in the government's financial and other documents. Since your government says it supports accountability and transparency, Will you release the contract so we can decide for ourselves whether we are receiving good value for significant amounts of money? Mr. Minis. There's two things I'd like to say, Senator. First, um, you might have seen a data released last week that shows that Canada ranks now third in the world for foreign direct investment. And I think this is a clear signal by the international investment community that they like what they're seeing in Canada in terms of the framework that we've put in place to attract investors it, to help us to build the economy and the jobs in Canada of the 21st century. In terms of the, the, the contract, my, I, I would be happy to provide you, to, to provide your office with, with an answer. I will consult my, my colleague, the Minister of uh, um, Innovation, Science and Economic Development to provide a specific answer to your question. Thank you. Senator Miville de Chen. Thank you. Welcome, Minister Guilbeault. The United Nations Environment Program just published its newest report on implementation of climate policies. And there's a comparison between climate policies and national commitments uh, for uh, there is a delay with the G7 countries for the United States, which is the country that is behind. The uh, comparison is 19 percent behind their commitments. Canada is 27 percent behind its commitments. There is too big a gap between our targets and our accomplishments. So between what we have promised to do and what we are really doing. Minister Gilbo, I know you are truly concerned by this. What is your government doing to get in front of this trend and to minimize this discrepancy? Minister, Minister, thank you. It's an excellent question. When we came to power in 2015, the projections were that Canada was going to at least beat its 2030 targets by 12%. Most recently, it's been shown that we are below the 2005 targets by 7 percent. So not only have we done that, but we have also eliminated a surplus that we were moving towards, and we reduced our emissions by 7 percent. In the last year, as minister, I announced a program on zero emissions. We're the first G20 country to have made accomplishments on fossil fuels Two years early, we have a new regulation for to be carbon neutral by 2035. We have a new initiatives that will be announced by the end of the year regarding the oil and gas sector, and that will have to do with GHD emissions in that sector. For 10 years, under the Conservatives, nothing was done in Canada, so we are now catching up on climate change. And if the Conservatives had kept the bar at the same level, it would be a different story. But in fact, progress was lost. Now it's showing that we are looking at 75 percent success rate to meet our targets by 2030. There's more work left to do, but we need to speed up. But as you know, there is a gap. According to the Commissioner of the Environment's 2023 report, the most important priorities to reduce GHGs has not, have not yet been completed, while other measures that are more restrictive for, restrictive for the oil industry are being postponed. But at the same time, the government continues to finance projects like Bay du Nord for oil and gas. So why is the government turning a blind eye to the oil industry and not acting further upstream? This would be a first step uh, towards achieving our short and medium-term targets. 
Minister, I do not share your opinion, Senator, nor when it comes to oil and gas measures, because the uh, carbon pricing does apply to that sector. We also already have a measure in place to reduce methane reduction uh, emissions, especially for the oil and gas sector, which needs to be reduced by 25% in the next 10 years to achieve at least 75% reductions by 2030. And we are the fourth biggest oil and gas producer on the planet. So we have uh, one measure which has not been put forward for the oil and gas sector, and I've just been minister for two years, is a GHG regulation, but this will be done. Thank given you. excuses. I've no, been doing the job Thank for two you, years. Madam Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for being with us today. Focus on affordable electricity. In yesterday's fall economic statement, there is a quote from Electricity Canada that supports your government's low-carbon commitments, maintaining that they will make electricity more affordable. Considering the extent of the tasks before us and the billions of dollars that are needed, how can the federal government ensure that Canadians will continue to enjoy affordable rates as we expand and clean the grid? Canada has one of the cleanest electricity grids in the world. We have reliable ele electricity and competitive rates. However, we know that our grid will need to expand considerably to meet future clean electricity demand and transmission needs, especially if we want to achieve Canada's target of generating 90% of electricity from non-emitting sources by 2030. Mr. Minister, How are we thank you, Senator. From the here. question, um, you're absolutely right. We have one of the cleanest grids in, in the world, which is why we've been able to attract companies like Stellantis and Volkswagen and, and others in Canada. Because one, and, and they've said so publicly. One of the reasons that they decided to come to Canada is because of our of our clean grid, um, which is a clearly a competitive advantage that, that we have and we want to maintain. And we, the world is, de is decarbonizing and the electricity sector in, in the world is, is decarbonizing. Uh, the, the, uh, the regulations that I've, that I've presented, the draft regulations to have a clean electricity grid, a carbon neutral grid by 2035, are very similar to the ones the, the Environmental Protection Agency has uh, presented in the U.S. And I, I it's, it is what we're trying to do it is a big undertaking, but we've done that in, in the last 40 years. We've doubled the size of our grid and we've cut the emissions in half well, by, by about 40% in, in, in the last three decades. So we need to continue on this track, accelerate it a little bit so that we can get there a bit sooner than what we, we expected, but we have had very uh, fruitful conversation with most provinces and territories on this, and, uh, and a number of companies, uh, system operators, um, utilities, both public and private, to ensure that we, that we can get there. Senator Lofreda. Merci. As, as announced in Budget 2023 and re reiterated in yesterday's fall economic statement, the government will outline a concrete plan to further improve the efficiency of the permitting and impact assessment processes for major projects by the end of the year. How confident are you that this plan will be released next month? And how will the work of the Ministerial Working Group on Regulatory Efficiency for Clean Growth Project influence this plan? We know the government is committed to ensuring major clean projects move forward quickly and effectively. It will be interesting you, to Senator. see when it it's a an important question. And, and a question. What we're trying to do there, as in many things, is to find the right balance. We, we want to be able to approve projects as, as rapidly as we can, while at the same time engaging local communities, indigenous nations meaningfully. And if we try and go too fast in our project approval, um, we may f find ourselves in a situation where, where local populations or indigenous nations feel that we're trying to steamroll them. And, and that's certainly, it's not something the private sector wants. It's not something we want. That being said, we, we do believe that we can find efficiencies uh, in, 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 a, in our permitting and approval process and, and do things in a way where we still meaningfully are able to consult local nations, lo lo local indigenous nations, and Merci, local Mr. Senator Block. Thank you, Minister. Minister, 
Agriculture has a huge economic potential. However, they need government support and investment that is commensurate with rising inputs, labor, land, transportation costs, and we can't forget about rising interest rates. Yet farmers have still been early adopters of new technologies and are always looking for ways to further improve their sustainability efforts. Your government has introduced programs to help farmers adopt new technologies, such as the Climate Action Incentive Fund, CAIF. This was a popular program. The ag industry liked this program so much that it was oversubscribed and applications have been closed since 2019. Minister, this was a program of your ministry. Funding like this does not exist through AFC. Therefore, can you let the Chamber know what other government programs exist through your department Department to support farmers, and how will your ministry help our farmers continue to transition to cleaner and greener practices? So that's a pretty yes. friendly Thank question you, Senator. right there. Over the last two years, our government has invested $1.5 billion in programs to support farmers to reduce emissions on farms and grow their operations. This includes, for example, $50 million to help farmers buy new grain drying equipment that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. More than 128 grain dryer projects have been approved. It also includes a $495 million investment in research, development, and adoption of clean technologies. And lastly, last but not least, $670 million to support the adoption of greenhouse gas reduction practices on farm. I, I agree with you. I think we need to continue supporting our farmers in, in this transition to a low-carbon future. They play such a key role in our society, and we will be there to continue supporting them. Senator Black. Thank you. Minister, according to AFC, between 1997 and 2017, agriculture saw a 50% 50, 50 decrease in GHG emission intensity, meaning that agriculture emissions have remained static, but they are producing twice as much food. These environmental and economic improvements were made by farmers without a price on carbon. Farmers from coast to coast to coast have shared with parliamentarians that due to the carbon tax surcharges, they don't have the available capital to continue to make green investments. Bill C-234 is before our chamber, which would free up capital for farmers to reinvest, to continue to sus sustainably intensify. Minister, will you support our farmers and help provide carbon tax relief so that they can continue investing in innovation? Monsieur le Ministre. We, you probably know, Senator, that we've already excluded 97% of on-farm fuels for, for equipment using, using fossil fuels. That was from the get-go when, when, when we introduced carbon pricing. So we've already recognized that there are some application in farming sector where there are no alternatives than using fossil fuel-based equipment. Um, and where we have, where, where we are putting a price on, pollu on pollution uh, in the farming center, uh, sector is where alternatives exist and we're supporting the farmers to adopt those alternatives. Senator Francis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister Giebel, one of the priorities in your most recent mandate letter pub published in December 2021 was to establish 10 new national parks by 2026 and enter into cooperative management agreements with Indigenous communities. It is my understanding that the establishment of the national park proposed reserve at Hog Island PEI would be the first step in fulfilling that commitment as well as subsequent ones. This sacred area holds historical, cultural, and environmental significance, and while all the necessary work has been completed, no progress has been made in over a year to preserve it. On behalf of the Abiquot Kauai, Mi'kmaq, and Islanders, I ask, when does the Government of Canada plan to establish and fund the National Park Reserve on Hog Island, PEI? Mr. Minister. Thank you, Senator, for the question. We, we, we have, in fact, have very fruitful uh, discussion to, to move forward this project. It's part, uh, as you rightly pointed out, it's part of a, a number of new national urban parks that, that we are moving forward. We need to finalize the funding to be able to, to, to make this project, as, as well as a number of others, come to, come to fruition. I would, ha I would, however, point to the fact that in the last month alone, we have announced new protected areas in Canada in collaboration with Indigenous nations that span more than one million square kilometer. That's roughly four times the size of the United Kingdom. So we are moving forward uh, on, on the creation of new protected areas and, and, and new parks, including national urban parks, in collaboration with Indigenous nations, including in PI, as well as throughout the country. Easy Senator questions. Well, thank These you last few have been really I look forward easy. to some positive news on this particular project in PEI in the near future. Native gentlemen. 
Senator, as do I. Mr. Minister, the micro was not on. Mr. Uh, Minister, the, your mic wasn't on. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Senator Batters. Minister, the Trudeau government's clean electricity regulations will cost Saskatchewan $40 billion by 2035, doubling electricity rates for the people of our province and putting hundreds out of work. The only people we want to see out of work are Liberal MPs, but Saskatchewan's already done that. After eight years of this Trudeau government, you have met your climate targets net zero times. The Environment Commissioner just told us your government is also unlikely to meet your 2030 target. Saskatchewan has a more affordable and realistic plan to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Why won't the Trudeau government let us use it? Mr. Minister. Her question is Senator, I disagree with everything you just said. Sure. Um, number one, we haven't, met, we haven't missed any of our targets. The, the target we have is for 2030, and we're, that's not what the Environment Commissioner said, Senator. This, the, the, the Environment Commissioner said that the window of opportunity is closing for us to be able to meet our 2030 target, and we need to accelerate the deployment of measure, which is exactly what we've said. And he said we weren't there yet, and I've said that a hundred times publicly that the plan that we have doesn't allow us to get us there. There's six more years where we need to deploy measures to ensure that we reach our 2030 targets. We have an interim 2026 targets which we're on track uh, of, uh, of meeting. And frankly, that 40 billion figure from the Saskatchewan government is based on no study. They've published no study for, 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 to, to, to back this, this number up. Uh, same thing for, for the increase in, in, in the rate of, uh, in the electricity rate in Saskatchewan. And your colleague earlier talked about the Canadian Electricity Association who said that they wanted to work with us to make this plan happen. So the industry is on, is on board. We have New Brunswick and Nova Scotia have already signed agreement with us to deploy a clean electricity grid in, the, in their provinces, and more provinces are coming on board. For ideological reason, the province of Nova Scotia has decided that they didn't want to, to take part in this endeavor, but we're, we're still willing to work with them despite that. About Senator half Batters. of our electricity Minister, is generated from Minister, I would have asked why your government is doing this to Saskatchewan, but Rural Economic Development Minister Goody Stop. Hutchings already gave us that answer. We don't elect enough Liberals. Saskatchewan prefers to keep that number at net zero. The Trudeau government's clean electricity regulations plan is a lot like electing Liberals. It's brutally expensive, it misses the mark, and you get net zero return. So Saskatchewan can address the emissions issue in a way that provides reliable power and is sustainable and affordable for our people. Why is it you think Ottawa always knows best? Monsieur le Ministre. As I said, we already have agreements with companies, uh, with provinces on, on clean electricity. And if there's a plan in Saskatchewan to reach net zero by 2050, I haven't seen it. And trust me, I have, I have looked long and hard and, and there is no such plan. Uh, Senator Carignan. Uh, it's a pretty big disagreement. Senator Carignan. Thank. All right. This guy is funny Thank sometimes. You, He's got a weird Speaker. delivery. Minister, the summer season that ended, that just ended, was disastrous from the point of view of forest fire, wildfires and forest fires from coast to coast. We saw that millions of hectares were ravaged. In fact, 6,650 fires raged. And in Quebec, according to the government sources that I consulted, the costs related to forest fires were between three and four billion dollars. So what will your government's contribution be to support provinces struggling with this environmental disaster? And will you financially support provinces to help them reforest? Minister. Hmm. Thank you, Senator. I'm pleasantly surprised to see that a Conservative senator recognizes the, uh, ch the impact of climate change on Canadian society. These are uh, unprecedented forest fires in the history of our country. There, that being said, there is a, fu a federal fund for disaster relief that is, has existed since 1970. Seventy-five percent of the funds were paid out over the six past years. So there is a, a high increase in the cost of natural disasters. The federal government is currently assessing, along with provinces and territories, the impact of forest fires. It's clear. Clearly, we will be there to help them meet a good portion of, those, of the cost of those disasters. We've got 
We know that we've lost, we were, our goal is to plant 2 billion trees between now and 2030. We have agreements with several provinces and territories in place, not yet with Quebec, but I do hope that that will happen soon. Senator Carignan, thank you. Still uh, in continuing with provincial assistance, you have a pro announced a new program to uh, you've announced a new program, which will be funded out of which uh, budget? Is it, does it, is it going to affect uh, the, the open house uh, Quebec initiatives and programs? That uh, will these provincial provinces be imperiled with the new pro house program that you ha you're, uh, that have just announced? Are you going to rob Peter to pay Paul? Minister, no, not at all. These programs yes, are piloted by though. the uh, Department of Natural Resources in Canada. So uh, my colleague, Minister Wilkinson, is responsible for those. There are two programs. The program you mentioned for uh, for energy efficiency renovations and then another program for the th uh, heat pumps. But we are not taking anything away from the energy efficiency renovation programs in order to subsidize thermal heat pumps. And that program is extremely uh, popular, by the way, in Quebec when it comes to heat pumps. For being with us here today, Minister. This Free morning, Canada's new chief climate negotiator, Michael Bonser, spoke with our Senators for Climate Solutions group. He reminded us that according to the latest global stock taking, we, Canada and the world, are not tracking well against our Paris Agreement commitments. Clearly, increasing ambition and having viable plans to meet that ambition will be key. As you head into COP28 in Dubai next week, Minister, could you tell us what Canada's top priorities, our must-achieve items are, and also the biggest challenges you expect to face at COP28? So top priorities to achieve and biggest challenges anticipated. That's a bit Mr. of a yes. neutral question. Thank you, like, Senator. Um, as, as, uh, as Mr. Bonser might have told you, um, Canada's been asked by the COP28 president to serve as co-facilitator for, for, for COP28. So we're one of uh, eight countries out of 194 who's been asked to do that. I was actually on the call at 6 o'clock this morning with the COP28 president plus a number of other ministers from around the world to start looking at um, what, are, what is absolutely needed to, to come out of, uh, of Dubai, of COP28, with a, with a successful agreement. And it's a combination of more ambition when it comes to mitigation. So how do we continue and accelerate reducing our emissions globally? Uh, we need to do a better job of supporting the Global South on, on, on adaptation to, to, to climate change. Many of these countries are, are, are feeling the impacts and they are on the front line of, of, of climate impacts. Uh, we also need uh, to support financing. And, and as you may have seen uh, recently in the news, under the supervision of, of Germany and Canada, uh, we've been working for the last three years to ensure that uh, developed nations uh, achieve the $100 billion goal that was set in Copenhagen in 2009. And according to the OECD, we have reached that goal. In fact, we've reached that goal last year. We've reached it this year. So we were supposed to reach it in 2020. This is a fundamentally important element of the negotiations going into into COP28. In fact, the COP28 uh, president, uh, Dr. Sultan Al-Jabbar, publicly uh, saluted that, uh, that achievement by, by country. So these are some of the issues Merci. we will need to tackle. Merci, Monsieur Ministre. Senator Kuo. Thank you, Minister. Um, you didn't get to the issue of challenges. Um, so at COP28, you'll be sitting down with some large emitting countries like China and India, countries critical to the global climate equation and countries Canada has strained relationships with. In this context, could you speak about the importance of climate diplomacy and how Canada will approach this work? Yes, sir. Thank you. I, I think um, our, our environmental diplomacy is, is an integral part of our overall diplomacy. Uh, the fact that the United Nations turned to us last year to host COP15, which we, we, we did uh, in close collaboration with China, despite some of, some of the tensions we've, we've had with this country, uh, and nevertheless, we're able to, to, to come to what many consider an historic agreement to, to, to protect nature, which is, which, which is what led me to go to China this summer so we can continue this collaboration, which is now the, the largest emitter of greenhouse gas on the, on the planet. We can't ignore a, a country like China, nor can we ignore a country like India. We need to find ways to work with them and find solutions, and that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, that, I don't know if that's true. Senator Galvez. Welcome to the Senate, Minister. First time I've seen I her speak. I would like speak. to continue to talk about the uh, price on carbon. 
some exemptions, uh, certain exemptions have existed since the carbon tax was conceived, notably for farmers and oil producers. Can you explain the reasoning behind these original exemptions, particularly on certain agricultural fuels or even oil production? What percentage of emissions from oil and gas production is subject to the carbon tax? Minister, as I said to your colleague earlier, when it comes to the agricultural sector, what we did, for example, is we looked at applications where there already were uh, alternatives for the agricultural se sector, and for and the applications where there was no alternative. The point of the carbon tax, of course, is to help change behaviors, whether that be at the industrial level or the indiv individual level. What we realized when it comes to the agricultural sector is that in some cases there are, all no, there are no alternatives, so we did not apply the carbon tax to those applications, uh, to those cases. But in other cases where there all are alternatives and where we do support farmers, in, in any case, we implemented programs and applied to the carbon tax, first of all, and then we, sub we implemented programs to support them for the transition to the greener uh, economy. Senator Galvez. Farmers, the technology to transition away from fossil fuels uh, for drying the grain exists around the world. So um, how long will it take to implement this technology that exists around in the world in Canada? Will it take eight years? Thank you. Monsieur, Monsieur Ministre. So I have time room for you, but I was, I was, as I was telling your colleague earlier, we, we have already supported uh, the, uh, the installation of 128 grain dryer projects that have been approved and supported by the federal government. I don't have the total, but we can, we can, we can get that information to your office. Senator Patterson Nunavut. Over here, Minister. Uh, thank you. Seven of Canada's la largest national parks are, in my view, disproportionately found throughout the North. Additionally, the Northern Coalition, a federally incorporated nonprofit representing Indigenous owned firms throughout Nunavut, Nunavik, Nunatsiavut, and Southern Labrador, in a written brief to the House of Commons Committee in December 2017, wrote that the Eastern Arctic and Labrador Sea region. All areas adjacent to Northern Coalition members are expected to contribute well over 50% of Canada's 2020 commitment to protect 10% of its marine environment. My question is this, Minister. As the Minister for Parks Canada and Environment, how are you and your department balancing your desire to achieve biodiversity and conservation targets with the need to stimulate and support strong economies in the North? Monsieur le Ministre. Thank you, Senator. For Minister. For the question, uh, the first thing I would say is that um, there are no new conservation projects that are being done on, uh, on Indigenous or Inuit land uh, without their consent and their, their full participation. Uh, and the, the agreements I was talking about a little bit earlier on uh, in, in Nunavut, in the Northwest Territories, or the agreement between the, the federal government, the government of British Columbia, and the Indigenous nations of British Columbia are clear signs that this is this is the only way forward when it comes to, to, to conservation, whether it's in the, in the north or, or elsewhere in, in, in our country. Um, we are looking at different models. For example, um, many of the models of conservation will, will allow for, for a certain number of activities, including some industrial activities, uh, ecotourism, fisheries, and this is something we co-develop with, uh, with, with uh, in your case, Inuit people in, in, in the north. We have an agreement with uh, QI, QIA, for example, on, on the establishment of a, of a new very large protected area, but it's done in, part, in true partnership with, uh, with the Inuits. Uh, Senator. You. Yes, yes, Senator um, Patterson. Th thank you for that. Um, yes, Minister, I, I know about that deal. Uh, but two different premiers have asked Canada to slow down establishing new protected areas in Nunavut until devolution. And on November 8th of this year, Nunavut Minister of Environment Daniel Kavik stated that bare ground caribou should not be listed as threatened under the Species at Risk Act and called on the federal government for action. So my question is this, you talked about collaboration with Indigenous partners, but I'd like to know how are you and your government working with the Inuit-led government of Nunavut to ensure that you are aligned on how to balance protection and development? Monsieur le Ministre. Thank you for the question. I, I met, in fact, uh, Minister Kavik uh, Nolud the day before yesterday. 
um, and I, I met with the Premier of, of Nunavut uh, in March when I, when I was there. The idea for us is not to impose on a jurisdiction new project. They have to be done in, in, in partnership. And although we, for, for the QIA project, the, the government of Nunavut has not, is not a signatory to, to, to that agreement. It is in the case of, of the Northwest Territories. And, and, and we, although they're not, they didn't sign, we know that they support the project. So it's important to us to ensure that th these are done in, 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 in collaboration. Senator Dalfon. Senator Dalfon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Welcome, Minister, to the Senate, especially this week. We have before us, as you know, we've got, uh, we have before us Bill C-234. a friendly question. Which would like to grant exemptions for the heating of farm buildings for a maximum of eight years. We also have the government, to see a government announcement if, of exemptions for heating oil for homes for a period of three years. We also see a House of Commons, on the other hand which re has refused to extend exempt exemptions for residential heat heating. Minister, don't you think that sending C-234 to the House of Commons will allow the elected officials to uh, make it a little more orderly and have a more consistent way of the approach to uh, these exemptions? Minister, of course, it's not up to me, to a House of Commons, uh, to tell you, Senators, how to behave. Uh, the Conservative Party does do that with Conservative Senators, but that is not the case for us. So you have all the freedom to do what you wish with Bill C-234. This is a well-known public fact that my party and myself are opposed to this bill and, did, and opposed it in the House of Commons. When it comes to uh, heating oil, and the, uh, the recent announcement on that, we did not apply the carbon tax because there was no alternative. Uh, what we realized with uh, he he heating oil is that people who are still heating their residences with heating oil do not have the means to make the transition to, therm to heat pumps despite the subsidies that we have in place. They still can't pay the difference in prices. So now we have a prog program to make the, uh, thermal heat pumps true. free for that chunk of the population. I believe the Prime Minister was quite clear on that. There will be no further exemptions to, the, to carbon pricing. Senator Delfon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister... If the bill were to come uh, to be sent back to the House, will the government commit to working with the opposition parties to find solutions that meet both the needs of uh, farmers more adequately as well as develop a more consistent policy when it comes to carbon pricing? Minister, of course. Of course. Senator Just a one word answer. Min it's a pretty easy please. question when it's a one Thank word you, answer Minister. or a very difficult Last week, question. You said about to, to see to Bill C-234, and I quote you, you said, we've already excluded 97% of uh, uh, the fuels used in, on farms. When we set up carbon pricing much? in Canada, the price of pollution, we, for the price of pollution, we realized there was no alternative. So the price of pollution in the agriculture percent only meets, only applies to 3% of the fuels being used. Farmers were very surprised to hear that statement first because the 3% does not seem to have any basis in science. And uh, uh, farmers using propane to heat their buildings, and, and for them, uh, many of them use propane, and for them it's 100%. Bill C-234 uh, presents no other uh, affordable alternatives. So, Minister, where did you get that number of 3%? It's and what affordable question. alternatives do you know, but that uh, scientists and farmers are unaware of? That's a hard question. He's going to stumble Minister, on this. Sir, I do not agree with your description of that uh, of that issue. But what you quoted He's earlier I repeat, was repeated notes. by me here, so uh, there's no surprise there. I would be very happy to send you the information we used, the data we used in creating carbon pricing and its specific application in the case of the agricultural sector. Earlier, I also listed a number of programs that we have, over $1.5 billion to support the agricultural sector to transition towards a greener economy. And we will continue to work with that sector to help them reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Hmm. Senator Boivnu, normally when 
well, I would like to know the th source of the 3%. You said that $500 million was available for transition on, on June 16, 2021. Your colleague, uh, then Minister of Agriculture, announced $500 million for the transition. It's quite a difference. $50 million, rather. Quite a, quite a difference. For when it comes to dryers, uh, you're talking about one-tenth of the uh, uh, previous member. So who's telling the truth, you or your colleague, Minister Gibel? You know that, Minister, you know that we're now in 2023, so Ms. Gibo made that statement uh, several years ago. I told you about a series of measures. I did it in English. I can repeat it in French, but $495 million for research, development, and adoption of clean technologies in the agricultural sector, $12 million for the production of methane emissions uh, for the bovine sector, $70 million, $670 million to support the adoption of greenhouse gas uh, reduction emissions on farms. Those are only a few of many of the uh, measures we have set up to help farmers reduce their the impact of their greenhouse gas uh, emissions in their sector. Mr. You have said several times there will be no more exemptions or carve-outs to the carbon tax as long as you're the environment minister. The majority of Canadians, and indeed the majority of the premiers uh, of our provinces, want the carve-out that C-234 brings. So, Minister, will you keep your promise and resign if Bill C-234 is passed in its original form? Isn't that, Minister, why you're calling Senators to talk against this bill, because you've threatened to quit if it passes? Is it more important for you, Minister, uh, to, to have your job than the livelihood of Canadian farmers? And is it more important to you than affordable food for Canadian families? That's a hard Mr. question, yes. guys. There are a lot of questions in your question, uh, Senator. Um, I, I, I haven't said I would, I, I would be resigning, and the Prime Minister of Canada has also said that there would be no exemption to carbon pricing in, in, in this country. And we have indeed fought two federal elections in 2019 and 2021 where Canadians had the opportunity to decide what, the, what they wanted, and twice they decided they, they supported carbon pricing. Senator Platt. Well, in fact, both of those elections, uh, the, the Conservatives got considerably more of the popular vote than the Liberals did. So I, I wouldn't quite uh, take that as, as solace that uh, you, you got a minority government the last time, Minister. You must really take Canadians for fools, Minister, uh, on this and many, many other issues. You made a clear promise. No more car votes, as long as you're the environment minister. And that's why you're desperate to avoid C-234 becoming law. You said in a recent interview, and I quote, I'm confident that there will be no more exemptions to carbon pricing. And then you say you don't, know, you don't whip. Why would you say that if you don't already know how senators are going to vote on this bill? Mr. Minister. Questions I would point out, Senator, point. that uh, in 2019 or 2021, the majority of members of Parliament who were elected to the House of Commons are from parties who, who believe in climate change, which the Conservative Party doesn't even do as an official position. And you, you spoke about the election as Senator, and I'm asking your question on, on, the, on the election. The majority of parties present in the House of Commons, the majority of MPs, believe we should be fighting climate change and support putting a price on pollution. Senator Miji. Senator Miji. It's only Thank with you, the Madam coalition Speaker. governments, though. Good day, Minister. I'm over here. Hmm. Your mandate letter stipulates that you must address systemic inequalities and disparities. Can you share with us tangibly how our environmental policies improve the standard of living of vulnerable people? Minister. Thank you, Senator. Earlier, the example that I gave of heating pumps, what we realized about that was people who use heating oils, and in Quebec, by the way, more people use heating oils than in all Atlantic provinces combined. So these people who use heating oil do not have the financial means to make a transition. That's why we put a program in place where the federal government, in collaboration with the provinces that are collaborating, will contribute a certain percentage which will allow to that will allow these families to save thousands of dollars per year and there are regional variations of course 
This is one of the measures we put in place. However, when it comes to climate change uh, adaptations, where there are agreements between the municipalities and provinces, we are making efforts uh, where there are zones, for example, in cities uh, where there are people who are more vulnerable. Uh, there are measures in place, for example, for heat waves. Senator Meiji. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Senator Wu. Madam Minister, the government is committed to a review of the GHG pollution pricing mechanism in 2026. It will assess, among other things, whether, quote, pricing stringency is aligned across all carbon pollution pricing systems in Canada. Can you tell us what that means and why it is important? Le ministre. Thank you, Senator. Um, so it, it comes down to the fact that we, when we instituted carbon pricing in Canada, there were already a number of jurisdictions who had their own system. British Columbia was one of them. Quebec was, was another, certainly two leaders in North America when it comes to putting a price on, 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 on pollution. And we, we didn't want to, to impose a federal system on, on, on those provinces. And, and other provinces had some initiatives. Even Alberta ha, had, a, had a pricing system for, 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 for large emitters. So what we decided to do is to give the option to, to jurisdiction in Canada that wanted to have their own system, but where the, the federal government would, would, ask as, would act as a benchmark. And we're, so that between jurisdiction, there is some equivalency in terms of efforts uh, when it comes to, to fighting climate change. So the, the review in 2026, and, and we, we, we did one last year, and we will do another one in 2026 to see whether or not that, that equivalency or that benchmark, if you will, is, uh, is still in effect. And, and will this 2026 review also look at the use of natural gas and propane on farms, including in barns and grain dryers, and assess if exemptions may be needed at that time, or conversely, if, uh, if such ex exemptions are already granted under Bill C-234, whether those exemptions should be reconsidered at that time in three years. Mr. Minister. What smiles I, in that I think what, what we're seeing is a, um, a, a rapid um, global and, 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 and rapid adoption of, of clean technologies in, in, in all sectors. Um, you, you spoke about specifically about agriculture. I'll, I'll give you an, another example to, 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 just to illustrate the pace uh, at which technologies are being adopted. In 2020, one in 20, according to the International Energy Agency, uh, just three years ago, one in 25 cars sold in the world was an electric vehicle. In 2023, it was one in five uh, globally, so I'm not, we're not talking about Norway or Sweden or so the, the pace of, of, of technology adoption in all sectors, including agriculture, is accelerating. And I, I anticipate that there will be very fossil fuels left in, in, in the agricultural sector in the coming years. Senator Wallen. Thank you. Pam Wallen, is uh, that Governments business? have a responsibility, Minister, to legislate within their know. own lane, but twice, first with Bill C-69, the No Pipeline Bill, and now with the so-called toxic single-use plastic bill, you have violated that. The court agreed that you were out of your lane and that the science is flawed, but you insist you will appeal costing tax dollars huge tax dollars to fight this in court. Should you not more bil diligently <clears throat> do your homework first and stop fighting with provinces in court and billing the public for your errors? I, I grew up watching. Thank you, Senator. Um, I, you, uh, you seem to forget that uh, just two years ago, we won in the Supreme Court on carbon pricing. Um, and on impact assessment, it was not a, a ruling by the Supreme Court, but, but an opinion. And that opinion did say that some of the, uh, the Impact Assessment Act was an unconstitutional, but they also confirmed that parts of the act were entirely constitutional. Uh, in terms of plastic pollution, I will make no excuse to fight for the, to protect the health of Canadians. We are finding plastic substances in our brains. We are finding it in our fetus. We are finding it in our kids. We're finding plastic pollution in our environment. And, uh, and we, I will continue to fight to protect the health of Canadians, and I will make no excuse for that. Senator Wallen. Just a very simple follow-up on another matter raised by so many of my colleagues here today. Why exactly do you oppose um, helping 
giving a small bit of help uh, to farmers and food producers with uh, some small relief from the carbon tax. If it's these are the people that feed not only us but the world. You have already had carve outs and help for others in need. Why is it that with farmers and food producers you seem so hell bent on just saying no, no more help for you? Mr. Minister. Maybe $1.5 billion is pocket change for you, but I think no, for, for most Canadians no, that, that's a lot of money and that's the money we've provided to farmers and we will continue supporting farmers. Senator Cardozo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Minister. My cat's got the Senate. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, uh, on the matter of, minister, of, of ministers talking to senators, my view is that if the whole world, every lobby group and every individual Canadian can talk to us, I don't know why the federal government and cabinet would not talk to us. So as the new independent Senate evolves, I would say you have an obligation to step up two-way communication with us. Um, on, on the matter of, of uh, Bill C-234, can you just remind us again some of the details you mentioned in terms of the 1.5 billion carve-out that already exists? That's Mr. a more Minister. challenging question. Thank That's you, supposed to be a uh, friendly, Senator. And, and, and I, I, I truly believe that um, we are better off as a nation now that we have independent senators in the Senate. And oh, that's just having conversation is very different than trying to, 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 to lobby people. And in fact, I have senators coming to me uh, to, 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 to talk to me about things that they, that they care about. And I think that's a, that's a very good thing for, for, for Canada. So I, I, as I was saying earlier, we, we've, we've, we've put in place more than $1.5 billion of, of support to the agricultural sector. Um, and I could give you the example of the uh, Barlow Farms, which is a 180-year-old family-operated farm, um, cash crop farm in, in York that received uh, more than $170,000 under the adoption stream to purchase and install a new mixed-flow grain dryer. As a result, the use of propane in the drying process will be reduced by 46%. That's the type of help we are providing to, to farmers across the country to help them reduce their carbon footprint and help them reduce their energy bills. Senator Cardozo? Yes, my, my second part of the question is just to take us back to why we have concern about carbon footprint. I think sometimes we go so far along the discussion on the environment, we forget why, we forgot to remind people of why it all started. What is wrong with carbon? Why do we, are we concerned about that? And on the carbon tax, why does it matter? Why are you taxing us if you're just going to give us the money back? I can't wait to hear the answer. Mr. Mini. I can't uh, wait to hear the I, answer. Two things I would say. If, um, if the Insurance Bureau of Canada was here, they would tell you that the cost of climate change to Canadians has gone up 400% in the last 40 years. This is cost that all Canadians are paying. For the, just in, in 2021, for the agricultural sector, $500 billion of climate impacts in, 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 in Canada. And, and the purpose of, 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 of our pricing pollution system is that we want this to be revenue neutral. So there's no money that's left in, in the government coffers. We return 90% of the revenues to households. And then people are free to decide what they do with this money. They can, they can continue use it, having the same habits in, in terms of consumption of fossil fuels, or coffee. they can change their, their habits and then start saving money and have money that they can do other things with rather than continue paying for, for fossil fuels. Uh, Senator Carignan. This is a lot of fun, everybody. I hope you're enjoying this. I'm having a great time. I'd like to time. come back to plastics. I, I hope you're enjoying too. Your initiatives on that are disastrous. The Canadian press showed us that poor communities, including in Myanmar, are strongly polluted, polluted by tons, thousands of tons of Canadian plastic. However, Environment Canada granted no permit for such exports to that country and experts at Environment Canada practically carry out no um, audits or checks on these loads on these cargo ships. You did have a program on single-use plastics and banning their use, including straws. But shouldn't the Canadian government first look towards what can be done in bigger uh, issues yeah. which are under federal jurisdiction rather than encroaching into provincial jurisdiction. 
It's a good question. I feel this like the federal government is seeing the speck in its neighbor's eye rather than the log in its own. Guys, Minister. that guy's sharp. For it's sure. ironic, Senator, that you are criticizing us to not do enough to fight plastic pollution on the one hand. And on the other hand, you say, you say, don't do too much to fight against plastic pollution. I think you need to make up your mind. It's pretty sassy And answer. the federal court judge's decision uh, did not invalidate the regulations that we put in place. So that's an important distinction. And as I've already publicly said... Since that judgment was handed down, I received correspondence from experts around the world saying that we will come testify for you, Minister, to talk about the impacts of plastic pollution on the environment and on Canadians' health. And we support your measures in fighting against plastic pollution. Senator Carignan. Hmm. He's not going to answer, I don't think. Plastic is exported and sent to developing countries, whereas here in Canada, 80% uh, of the plastic leaves. So you are not representing the facts accurately. How about Claude? And Let's get a thumbs the federal up government Claude. is encroaching on provincial jurisdiction when it comes to this plastic pollution issue. And to be sure, the plastic pollution sent by Canada to other countries is a disgrace and you should be ashamed. Minister, once again, you are contradicting yourself. You say we have to fight against plastic pollution, but federal government, be careful, don't do too much. The judge at the federal court uh -huh. handed down the decision, and we will see if this case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. But I think that our approach to plastic pollution was celebrated by numerous experts around Canada, by ONGs, um, by NGOs, rather, My opinions among dis others. Senator Mivin Dishen. are different than, than Stephen Gabo's. I've got different... I have a question, Minister, a on C-234, which is a bill here which has been uh, inspiring much debate and is uh, very polarizing. I'm trying to understand the numbers. You set up a refundable tax credit in 2021 for farms in carbon pricing. I want to understand if you have any calculations that shows whether this refundable tax credit is uh, succeeding in helping support farmers when it comes to carbon pricing. I'm not able to carry out that calculation. I'm not an accountant. Would you be able to provide us with some numbers so we know what we're looking at? Is this a refundable tax credit that makes up for all of carbon pricing or no? Minister, I don't have those numbers with me, but we certainly can provide them to you. Senator Mivin uh, Yes, as quickly as possible since we are debating this issue currently. Any supplementary question? No. Senator Dajne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, when you were an environmental activist, I uh, saluted all of your uh, actions. But to be a politician with Justin Trudeau, you have had to uh, accept that a pipeline was purchased. Uh, you had to approve the Bay du Nord project. And now when it comes to exemptions in carbon pricing, I would consider these to be uh, election-minded compromises. Are you ready to make other compromises uh, to your environmental values to remain a member of the cabinet? Minister Gibo, our government has been doing more to fight climate change than any other government. I have named many measures that I myself put in place in the past two years, two years whether it be uh, regarding methane, clean energy, yeah, it's a cash grab, carbon neutrality, or other initiatives. There is no other G20 country that has... I don't like when they talk about the G20 made certain accomplishments that we have made. So it's not easy for us to... It would be easy to get rid of our s subsidies to the oil and gas sector if no more oil and gas were being um, created, but that's not the case. I am a father of four, so in this country, I never expected that I would win all of my battles. I don't at home either. 
But here we are fighting against climate change, and it has never been done so strongly in Canada. I will be the very first to admit that we need to continue working on this issue. And it's not by standing idly by or doing as conservatives do. There's no magic switch that we can turn off to turn off climate change. This is arduous work that we have to complete in the coming years, even in the coming decades, to succeed. I believe it's possible, but we need to keep working. Senator Dejne. Of course, since you've been in the position, there have never been so many uh, rules regarding the environment uh, and never as much investment. $200 uh, billion dollars have been invested. But your objectives are never accomplished. The Climate Change Performance Index uh, classes Canada at 58 uh, on the list for your accomplishments. So what is it that's not working when we look at the big picture uh, and when it comes to setting attainable it's be targets? Close to retiring as Minister. Well. I do share your Damn, frustration. Wallen can't be a spring chicken either. Because between the time when we put measures in place, when we adopt measures, between that time and the time that they roll out, it takes quite some time. So I know that analysts at different organizations, such as the Climate Performance Index, will see that Canada is improving because they will see all the efforts that we are making. And they'll see that climate change has started to decrease in Canada. We have a better numbers uh, between 2019 and 2021 for GHG emissions. And they are very good um, compared to our G7 uh, peers. Uh, the pandemic was also a difficult period, uh, and I am the first to say that there's much work left to do. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gignac. Thank you very much for your political uh, dedication. Before being a politician, you... Uh, were, had a great global uh, reputation. It's not always easy to keep that when we switch to politics. Uh, I support the uh, carbon pricing. It has been uh, well-founded by experts. Yeah. Uh, talking about Which how experts? you exempted uh, diesel but not natural gas, um, I will reflect on the answers you've given. But I wanted to talk about t the October 26 in the Atlantic region and how you are focusing more on the Atlantic region. But there are other people in Ontario and other communities across Canada who are low-income families and who need more support. So I was wondering why the Atlantic provinces were focused on uh, and are they seen as more important than other low-income households across the country. You I'd gave like that to spiel at the beginning. That. Minister, but it's still a good question. thank you very much, Senator. Thank you for your kind words. And I would just bring a correction. The exemption uh, for heating oil is not only for Atlantic provinces, it's across Canada. So that initiative applies across Canada. Just like the heating pump initiative, which has been rolled out across the country, we currently have three countries who have an agreement with the federal government on that. And I think in the coming week, or at the very most in the next month, we will have many more provinces who will have adhered to the heating pump program, of which will benefit low-income households. Free, heat, free heat pumps. He just stuck it in there. While waiting. No free heat pumps. Uh, so so I understand free. that other provinces will also be able to uh, benefit from this program. Thank you, Minister. Would you like to respond, Minister? I believe he answered his own question. Senator Plett. Okay, Minister, here we go. again on Bill C-234, and I keep coming back to the same thought. You are asking an unelected Senate to do what you couldn't do in the elected House. This bill passed the House of Commons with wide support. The vote wasn't even close, and you keep on referring to it as Conservatives against the world. The Conservatives, the NDP, the Bloc, and the Greens supported this bill unanimously. Even some of your own Liberal MPs, including the chair of the Ag Committee, supported it. We don't often see consensus like that anymore, and it was good to see MPs coming together to support our farmers. Now you're asking unelected senators to do what you could not do in the House, kill or gut this bill. Why should senators do what you want them to do instead of respecting the will of the majority of the other place? 
Don Plett is great, guys. As you know, uh, Senator, as a senator, you, you should know that the, that the Senate is a recognized institution as, as part of our parliamentary system. I'm not telling anybody uh, how to vote in, 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 in this institution. I'm having conversation with, with some of them about my position on, on, on this bill, which is no surprise. I, I publicly stated that I was against it, so it shouldn't come as a shock to anyone. But I, I believe that the Senate is a, is a very important part of our, of our parliamentary system. And, and senators should be able to make the decisions that they want without being pressured by, by, by the House of Commons. And I, I'm not pressuring anyone, as opposed to the Conservative Party of Canada, who's launched a, a campaign uh, against senators who, who don't agree with them. I, I find that very um, troubling. Senator Platt. Minister, I find very troubling your accusations here instead of answering my questions. One day we're called um, bullies and the next day we're called whipped. I mean, it's got to be one or the other. Minister, I asked you at the very outset a question that you did not answer. So let me ask that question again now. How many senators have you called in the last two and a half or three weeks to speak to them about the weather or tell them what your idea is about this bill. You say it's public knowledge where you stand on this. Why would you need to call a senator to talk about the bill if it's already public knowledge where you stand? Why did you call them? And how many have you called, Minister? Oh, my goodness. Mr. Minister? What are his questions? Um, in sort of answer to the first part of your question, I'd say it's both in, in the case of, the, uh, of, what's, of what we're seeing here, Senator. Honorable Senators, the time for question period has expired. All right, guys, that just about wraps it up. I had a blast here tonight. I hope you did too. What I need you to do, or what, share it with somebody if you enjoyed this experience. We'll be doing this more. We will be covering the Senate more. This is my first question period where they had an MP attend, and that is super interesting. I like the Parliament question periods, and I'll be covering those. I cover those live as well. And I also make highlight videos of them daily. But if you enjoy the Senate stuff and you know anybody else that might, let them know. Spread it out. Like, nobody's covering the Senate. No, nobody's, I don't know anybody that is. So I hope you enjoyed it. I had a blast. It's fun hanging out, doing a little chat, getting to hang out with everybody. It's fun. My cats were freaking out earlier, but, you know, it's that time of night. It's, all, it's after midnight here. I've got to get up for work. I work at 7.30, not that that's a short amount of time or anything, but yeah. Hope you enjoyed it. My name's Aaron. This is Question Period Canada. Most of the time we're just trying to have fun and kind of be silly with Canadian politics, but here it's serious. I love this stuff. It's so interesting and learning so much quickly. Enjoy hanging out with you guys. That's fun too. Anyway, like, subscribe, share, all those things. Leave some comments, stuff like that. We're going to get going. Got to get ready for bed. Hit the sack. Thanks for watching. I had a blast. This was so interesting. I hope you found it interesting too. Catch you all next time. We're definitely going to be covering every Senate that Senate question period that has an MP that, that's coming to answer questions because I want to see some of these cabinet ministers under, under Donald Plett's questions. Wouldn't that be interesting, right? Anyhow, I got to get going. Thank you for watching. I'm Aaron, Question Period Canada. Catch you next time. See you tomorrow, hopefully. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night.